Thank you for joining us for Ideas in Action with Gabriela Burnham and Kali Fajardo Anstein. I'm Joshua Carrera and project coordinator at Mayday Space here to introduce tonight's event. We are partnering with One World to make virtual space for a conversation between these writers whose work is a tribute to language, to creating art, to the complexities and joys of place, communication, and location. At Mayday Space, we believe a radically more just and equitable New York City is possible. We're a multi-story organizing center here in New York City that is both a neighborhood resource, a citywide and global destination to amplify issues such as immigrant rights, food justice, tenant protections, as well as broader global issues such as climate justice and internet freedom. I am excited to, now, to announce that in addition to partnering with One World, today we are also launching the registration of our six week free class on race and revolution in the US with professor and scholar, Dr. Johanna Fernandez, which you can learn more about on our social media page. Tonight, Gabby and Kali will be in conversation with One World Senior Editor, Nicole Counts, who I will be passing the mic to. Nicole, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited for our latest Ideas in Action event um, with two of my uh, favorite people in the whole world. So first up, we have Kali Fajardo Anstein, who is author of Sabrina and Karina, the National Book Award finalist, a finalist for the Penn Bingham Prize, the Story Prize, and was awarded the 2020 Reading the West Award in Fiction. Here she is. Hi. Um, <laughs> and next we have Gabrielle Burnham, the author of It Is What It Is Stone, her first novel. She's a dual citizen of the United States and Brazil, holds an MFA in creative writing, was a reporter, a creative writings teacher, and, an and worked in immigration law. Hi, guys. Hi. I'm so happy to be talking to you. I also just realized I, I wish I wore blue so we could look like um, the Powerpuff <laughs> Girls. I know. <laughs> Should have coordinated. <laughs> I love it. It looks great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of the in-between of you two, which feels appropriate. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm so excited to be talking to you both, um, you know, for a lot of reasons, but I think primarily because both of your fiction is so transformative for me personally, um, probably because it situates itself in realistic fiction, but also feels like it's transportive because it takes place in, um, you know, places that I don't live in and didn't know as much about until I started working with you guys. So, um, you know, first, first off, Gabby, you released your debut book in the middle of this um, quarantine and Kali, you released your paperback during quarantine. So I'm just wondering, you know, how has that process been during lockdown? How has your writing been? How are you guys? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, in some ways, this was my first book, so I I don't know any other way. I've just been doing Zoom events and living in the virtual space. In some ways, like it's nice because at the end of an event, you can just go and decompress on your couch instantaneously, uh, which is lovely. But I was just talking with my sister who just started law school um, like last week, I think, and Emil, my partner is also starting school and they made the point that like at the end of their class they just shut their computer and then they're alone in a room and that's that's the hard thing I think about doing these like missing those serendipitous moments with readers and with other panelists because in some ways that's where the the um you know those fun and interesting moments happen not really like in the official event but in those little conversations afterwards so that's been hard but you know, something to look forward to with book yeah. two and three and four and the rest <laughs> of the, you know, one day we will get out of this, so. <laughs> How about you? Uh, that's so interesting. My little sister just started her second year of law school. No way. Yeah, like, like two weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, I didn't cool. know that. Hear that. That's, that's super cool. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, so I debuted last year um, when I could be in person with people. So it is a big difference for me, but I also am somebody who's always sort of been comfortable in the digital space. I have like a kind of 
like, I don't know how popular it was, but I had like a Denver MySpace when I was young and I had like a really weird name. And so like, I always have been like pretty comfortable online, but I definitely miss being able to hug my readers and take pictures together. But I love our little Zoom pictures that we all take together now. And I think they're, yeah. they're kind of neat. We should have like a scrapbook. Um, but it's definitely the, the way that we promote is different. Um, and it's, it's really important, I think, to always be thinking about other writers too. And like, if you have a platform sharing, sharing work because the space is just so different um, than it was even last year. I feel like, you know, one of the reasons that, well, at One World when we're kind of like, every month we think about what ideas and action events should we do, who should we partner together. And I actually think because of quarantine, I thought about you two together. I think one of the things that's nice is that um, I'm always someone who I think likes talking to my authors and tries to really often, but I feel like I've been on the phone lately with a lot of authors, which has led to more conversations about everything, not just like the actual edits, you know what I mean? And both of you who I know really well have expressed to me these kind of, um, you know, remarkable or otherworldly moments in your writing where like you've either written something and then you called the family member and it actually ended up happening in your family or you started, you know, doing research and you, you unearthed the photo of a character that you've already written. So it, it's interesting because I think you both have tapped and I don't want to call it supernatural, but you've tapped into some sort of like familial space. And I, I just wanted to hear you guys talk about that. I can, I'll, I can go because I just sent Nicole a picture like two days ago. I was like, oh my God, I know it's Sunday. Pay attention to me. I found another picture. <laughs> um, I, think, I think for me, uh, it happens more and more frequently. And I think it's just because I've been writing longer. And sometimes that those connections are embedded in your psyche in a way that you're not really aware of. Um, so I'm thinking of times recently as I'm working on revisions of my, my forthcoming novel, I was talking to my godmother, she's in her 80s, and I was talking about her grandmother, who would be my great, great, great grandmother. <laughs> so I, I did not meet her, um, but I described a scene that I had envisioned that I'm working on and my godmother was like, yeah, yeah, that happened. Yeah, we used to wait outside and like this man would come visit her and I was like, what? What do you, what do you mean it happened? She's like, yeah, yeah, what you're describing is real. Um, and so those kinds of things happen all the time. I'd be curious, Gabby, I want to hear about like how, how it works for you. Does it ever come in dreams or anything like that? Or like, where do these occurrences show up? I'm, I'm just so curious. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot because I'm not someone who like really believes in magic or like the supernatural. I'm not super woo or anything like that, but I have had experiences in my writing where I've written something and um, in speaking with my mother found out that it's actually something that happened with our family. Um, or, or even just writing um, a sentiment down that like later I've gone back and connected it to something else, even if it's not that specific. And I, so I want to know what, like, why, why does that happen? How does that happen? You know? And so I've been thinking, and, and in thinking about this event too, I've just been thinking about like what it is that I love about fiction. And I think fiction, you know, draws on things that we know about the world to be factually true. It draws on history and it is kind of like a continuation of a conversation about what the world is. But then it also draws on our present experience as humans and personal experience too, like the way that I move about the world. But then the thing about fiction is that it also has the imagination tied in. So in that way, it's the future. It's another world. It's something that's outside of the past and the present. So it's fiction connects past, present, and future in this really incredible way. And it's, you know, one writer, one person channeling that. So it's a really powerful force in that sense, in the way that other mediums aren't necessarily. Not to like, I mean, I love all different kind of poetry and nonfiction, <laughs> different types of art. But I think fiction has that specifically. But I've also been thinking a lot about, and this is something that, um, Dr. Mona, I think, brought up in your uh, 
uh, One World event with her and um, Ibram X. Kendi. It's this like a uh, burgeoning field in science called epigenetics, which is the concept that like environmental factors actually alter your DNA. Um, things like stress, um, pollution, like the environment. But I think also preference, pleasure, love. So when you think about that, the fact that like, you know, historically speaking, your great, great, great grandmother experienced something, then perhaps changed her DNA and perhaps was literally passed down to you through, you know, your, your cells cellularly. I mean, that's, that's kind of what we're conjuring when we create fiction. Um, like on that, like, Something that I think you both um, do, this is more woo-woo than maybe like you would um, say, Gabby, but I feel like, uh, you know, I, I've talked to each of you about generational trauma and generational kind of just like knowledge and history. And I think I do believe it gets trapped within ourselves when those truths aren't, when they aren't spoken. And I mean, you know, Polly, this is something like we talked so much about with Sabrina and Karina, but I think we, we talk about it kind of in a deeper level with, with the novel that you're writing, where like, you almost have to say it just so it can be out there so the next generation is no longer holding it. And, you know, Gabby, you had a very physical reaction to writing the book, like a very painful reaction. And I feel like it's partly because you were expelling parts of, you know, the history that no one had ever been asked to expel before. Yeah, that's so true. That's the... Um... I mean, that's the beautiful thing and also the burden of, of stopping the line of intergenerational trauma. Right. Um, but um, what do you guys think is kind of the hardest part of writing that, that kind of work? Like really like kind of del or writing that work, but also delving into the history, like family history or whatever, like what has been, I guess, some of the, you know, hurdles to that? I'll say that when I was younger, the, the main hurdle was feeling that I had permission to be able to write about those things um, because they were still, they were things that I wasn't sure that we were allowed to talk about outside of the family and even outside of my own mind. You know, some things you don't, you don't feel comfortable sharing that you have these thoughts or you have these feelings with other people because you don't want to be judged. You don't want to be seen as damaged. You don't want to be seen as a traumatized person. <laughs> so I think, I think in the early stages of my writing, just allowing myself permission to write about what haunted me most and what scared me most. Um, but yeah, it's really been about just being able to have ownership and then writing, writing about certain events with compassion and empathy for those who experience them in addition to myself, especially if I didn't even experience them if they happened to an ancestor of mine. Um, so just thinking of like ethical ways to deal with memory has been um, a question for me. Mm. I like that, like thinking of ethical ways of dealing with memory, you know, like taking the ethical into every single part of our work. Um, so I'm curious to hear more about both of you, you know, your research and how you integrate that into fiction, you know, like how you literally sit in archives, Kali, um, or go back to Brazil and visit family, Gabby, um, and then take those experiences and write them into your fiction. Yeah, I think research um, with fiction is interesting because I think part of the research is like an internal investigation. And I, you know, what you were just saying, Kali, about like having permission to write about these things. Part of it is that like, you might be like with me, I was like figuring out my own, you know, sense of self or like my relationship with what I was writing about. And you kind of have to let go into that, knowing that you're going, part of the work is like sorting through, um, you know, yourself through writing. So that's some of the research with fiction. Um, but then, yeah, I think like the fun of it too is just like being able to go to Brazil because I'm writing about Brazil, like seeing my family and reconnecting with them or just, you know, choosing, being like, I'm really, I'm bringing a lot of like nature writing right now because I want to write more about the natural world. And that's the, the joy of research for fiction too, is that you get to choose something that you really love um, because you want to put it in your book and like 
somehow build this imagined world with these things that you're learning about or, or IRL world, you know. <laughs> I, I read this Q&A with you, Gabby, and you talked about when you went to Brazil and you, I think you said you like drank and you danced and you swam and then you wrote everything down. And yeah. I was like, oh, do you do it like immediately that night? Or do you, do you have like a special notebook? Like I was so curious about your methodology of, of gathering. I, um, right, with, I have mole skin. I like take a lot of pleasure in figuring out what color I'm going to do next. And yeah, I write, I handwrite everything. Um, and it might be like immediately, like sometimes you have to, to write something down instant. It's like you cannot move if you don't get it out and put it down immediately, I think. Um, I think I saw you, you posted something. They were like, I have a short story inside me and I have to run home and write it right now. <laughs> and I know that feeling. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think I also don't pressure myself to do that. I think sometimes it's nice to like let experiences sort of simmer inside you and then they, they come up in writing in these really unexpected ways. Um, that to me in some ways is the hardest part of writing fiction is that um, you have to be willing to kind of like let yourself go in it a bit um, and not try to like control every part of it. There are parts of it that are really in control and that you can hang on to and then there are other aspects of it that it's just you're allowing yourself to meander in a space that's a little like um, hazy and dark but it will it will clarify eventually. Yeah no I definitely I definitely feel that like in, in terms of my research I know Nicole mentioned that I like hang out in archives. Well, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> so, uh, this graveyard. <laughs> I feel like really like there, that is one of the things I miss most are being able to go to the library and use the private rooms to write and also going to research in person. Uh, but I have found a new uh, form of research that I really like. I wrote a new story yesterday and I went to, <laughs> I went to the building where this historical event happened in the 90s that I had read about and I didn't really have an agenda. I just kind of wanted to feel the mood of that space and that structure. And so I'm sure I freaked all the guards out in the building because I was like walking around like all in white. That's like the new thing I do for some weird reason. Mm -hmm. I used to only wear black and now I wear only white. And I, I had like a manila envelope, so I looked really creepy. And I was just like walking back and forth until I was like, oh, they think I'm doing something strange. And then I left. But after I left, I kind of like I sat down and I just sort of like pushed out the atmosphere of what I felt in the building onto the prose. Um, so my relationship with research is it's pretty wedded to my work at this point. And I, I don't know if it'll change, if some days I'll, I'll pull back from it, but right now I really love it. It, it helps your imagination. <laughs> like it's just like a, it's like a bumpers at the bowling alley. It's like more, <laughs> more to guide you. It's really nice. <laughs> it's funny that you don't know why you're wearing all white, where I feel like you wore all black when you were like, also deep into the rewriting of Sabrina and Karina, which I feel like a lot of that book happens by night, like under the moon versus Woman of Light. I mean, it's literally called Woman of Light. It's so like startling bright, the way that you learn of these characters and stuff. Um, interesting. Your editor thinking. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, yeah, my white clothes phase. We should go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you both are right though. I think that fiction, what it can teach you versus maybe any other writing is it can teach you to let go of control. I mean, I think that's one of the big life lessons that we all learn in our own ways. But I think fiction writers, they get a sense of the ne the necessity of meandering, the necessity of wandering to understand yourself, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I don't know if I've actually ever asked either of you this directly, but, you know, you both write about place in very beautiful and vivid ways, and you both know that I love, you know, any kind of place-based writing, but I'm wondering if you ever got any, you know, pushback about the places that you write about, or if anyone ever told you, you know, no one's going to care about Denver, no one's going to care about this American in Sao Paulo, you know? Mm. Yeah, I think the struggle for me, I didn't, I honestly didn't really care if anyone was like, no one's going to read um, about uh, Brazil, because I, I just knew that's what I needed to write. But I think that what I was nervous about is that the stakes felt so high, because my entire family's from there, but I didn't grow up there. Um, you know, I grew up in the United States. So, you know, I really felt like I need to get this right um, because I'm the first 
non, you know, I, I'm the first person and my family is not from Brazil in that same way. So it was, the stakes were high for me and that I want to make sure that I'm, I'm um, accurately representing the energy that I feel when I'm there and that the energy that I feel is, is an experience that other people feel there and it's not just me as a visitor um, experiencing that. And also just like little things like, what if I get a road wrong and everyone in Brazil is going to point it out, you know, stuff like that, those kinds of anxieties. Um, but, you know, I think place is really important to um, my novel and it's been really nice to see how um, people really feel connected to Sao Paulo when they read it. That's honestly been the most incredible feedback that I've gotten on my book is that um, people have really connected with the descriptions of Sao Paulo. So... Well, I, I couldn't tell if anything was wrong. So because I'm not from there, so I was like, oh, everything's right. Everything's in its right place. <laughs> um, for, for me, I'm still like, I'm shocked even now when I'm working on new work, I'm still surprised that I get a write about Denver and people care. Like mm -hmm. I, it's really ingrained in me this, um, this insecurity that I had growing up here that we weren't in any movies, we weren't in any TV shows, we weren't in any novels, Barely, there were you know very few, and if we were, they were not about people like me. So um, it was really hard to imagine that. So I still, in the back of my head, while I'm working, sometimes I'm like, who's gonna care about Denver? And I have to really push through that because uh, to care about one place is to care about all places. If you look at the place deeply enough, um, it's sort of like the individual of a person. That individuality is universal. And so the deeper you go into a place, the more you can connect to other places, I think. Um, but it has been a pleasure to bring Denver to the world. I'm really curious now that the book is, has been translated into Japanese, I'm really curious how readers there will respond to Denver. Um, so it's exciting. Mm. Oh, I love hearing you talk about that. I also agree, like if you understand one place, uh, some of my favorite folks, books are not actually about the place I grew up in, and yet I feel like I understand it in a different way. It's, it's interesting that you you just brought up your Japanese translation, because one of my favorite books is Territory of Light, which takes place in Japan, and I feel like I know that character in that place as well as I know the place that I grew up. Um, so, you know, one of my favorite things about both of your writing, and I actually think something that a lot of readers uh, bring up for both of you is the way you write women. Um, specifically that, you know, you're not trying to write women that are any kind of like boring stereotype or, you know, are predictable in any kind of ways. And so I, I want to know how each of you approach, you know, maybe any characters you create, but specifically um, when you're in scenes maybe where it would be easy or natural to kind of defer to some sort of stereotype or whatever it is. Um, yeah. And how you guys challenge yourselves. Hmm. Do you want to go, Colleen? I, I don't have an answer yet, but if you have one like on the tip of your tongue. <laughs> well, I think that, um, you know, writing, I, I'm learning more and more that I am interested in writing characters that um, are contradictory by nature. That, um, and I think that that's, that's just the way that I, I approach fiction in general and the fiction that I love. I love um, fiction that asks complicated questions and doesn't worry about um, finding an answer to them. And so I love characters that do that, that hold, mm -hmm. hold opposing realities because that's what human beings do. They, um, human beings are deeply uh, contradictory and that statement even of, in and of itself is a cliche but it's true I mean we can be two things at once and I think with Linda um, she's an uncomfortable character to sit with at times because of that fact of in her personality that she um, is someone who's individually traumatized but is also privileged that she cares for people but also betrays them um, that she loves Marta, but it's terrible to her um, at times. So, um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm really kind of interested in, in characters, whether they're women or not, although I, I am, I think, predominantly interested in women um, and relationships between women, but I'm just interested in that in general. Um, so I think that that's why it comes out, um, you know, in my characters. 
That's so, that's so interesting. Um, have you gotten the question yet? Why do you write about women? Have you gotten that like from interviewers? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> have like, you? I get it all the time. I don't think oh, love interesting. It. Now, yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm interested in writing about women. Um, mm-hmm. Now, now that you say that, Gabby, about you, you know, sort of the idiosyncratic nature of who you're drawn to, I, I think about when I was growing up, I didn't really ever feel like I was like a belonger. I always felt like an outsider in mm. almost every space that I was in. Like even in the familial space, I felt like a black sheep. Um, they might disagree. They might be like, we liked her. But um, <laughs> I don't know about that. But I, I, do, sure. I, feel, <laughs> I do feel like orienting yourself as an outsider um, allows you kind of see see that nature in other people too and accept them and embrace them for that and a lot of my characters really are sort of they're on the fringes they're rebellious Mm -hmm. they're not they're not like the most beloved person of the family they're sort Mm -hmm. of out in the distance um and then i think when i run into if i ever have a character that falls into stereotype um i have wonderful readers i have my my wonderful editor nicole and they're usually, they're, they're characters that are on the, the periphery. So they're not like the main character. It'll just be like somebody in line at the bank. And somebody's like, hey, you're falling into shorthand here. And I'm like, oh, I'm being a lazy writer. And so mm-hmm. I think it has to do with too, like being a strong writer and using all of your skills all the time, even for the characters who aren't main stage. Like if, even if they're just sort of off in the cafe shadows in the back, they still need to be a full human being there and not just like a prop that's just sitting around. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's the people in the back. Um, and I think you know, in in your character, sorry to interrupt, but like, um, you know, I so feel that in your characters, Kali, that you're representing characters who feel on the fringe. But what's amazing about that is that I think in a lot of ways, like whatever, what's normative is a myth. And that actually this is true for many people, the way that your characters um, you know, pass through life is a, the way most people, I think, pass through life. But because stories that um, appear to be more normative are always told, then everyone's feeling like this is what I'm supposed to be, but I'm never meeting that. Um, and and I think fiction and, and telling more stories that are actually a better representation of what life actually is like, like for most people in the world will make people say, wait a second, that's actually how I felt at that time in my life or that actually was my experience yeah Yeah, definitely I totally agree I mean I think I think to your point of normative Gabby something I've been thinking about a lot is like how the old guard of Hollywood used to say things like you know no one wants to see the truth like we want to see things that we aspire to whatever or however that they wanted to uh like rephrase what they were doing but I think the truth is we we do want the most powerful things are the things where we can see ourselves, because then we can also see ourselves getting out of something, or we can see ourselves moving forward, you know? Yeah. And we see ourselves as worthy enough to tell a story about, which is, you know, something that um, I just, I think that a lot of media doesn't think that way, you know? Um, they kind of, it kind of brings me, like, a little bit of what you were saying, Gabby, about your characters and, um, you know, some of the power structures you guys write. and. I'm wondering how, even when some of the writing feels uncomfortable maybe between two characters, like if there's a fight or one character is being mean to another character or one character is obviously more powerful in some way, whether it's two women, whether it's a man and a woman, how how do you handle writing those things, you know, that feel kind of Mm -hmm. hard to, you know, hold? Um, Well, I actually, it's almost the opposite for me when I feel like a a scene or a conversation between characters feels too um, tied up or too easy. I push myself towards it. um, What's actually a different direction it could go in. Um, I actively try to work out because I mean, and this relates completely to your point of like old Hollywood wanting to um, keep these like aspirational stories uplift. I mean, this is still true today in Hollywood. It's still true today in publishing that, um, you know, 
there's a archetype of a story that needs to be told and there it's built in all of us so when i write a scene where it feels very normal or expected or i know that i'm writing something that's been told to me over and over again and so i have to push myself towards like actually what would happen and that feeling is so uncomfortable because it's like the thing that i've been told over and over again or like the way i've imagined this conversation would go um is you know it's so ingrained in me that having to break from that is a very uncomfortable feeling for a writer and i think for a reader too the experience of reading it something that's a little like wait <laughs> this kind of just like jarred my whole understanding of how this is supposed to go. But actually that's closer to the way things actually are. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 comfortable I, with this agree. Comfort, I think. Um, some of my earlier work, I noticed that my characters would get like to the point where they're about to like fight each other. Like they're yelling at each other or they're getting there and then they'd be like the doorbell ring and then they go and answer the door and they, they it's all <laughs> like, the tension's gone. And I would do yeah. it over and over and over again. And I, it's because I did not want to go in there. Like I was like, I don't want to deal mm -hmm. with this if they get involved in this. Um, but as I, as I grew as a writer, I allowed them to go there. And time and time again, they surprised me. Um, sometimes somebody was a bigger person. You know, things really started happening that were like sparky. Like when I would actually allow them to live their lives outside of like my um, tyranny, me trying to control my characters like little puppets. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think it's, it's interesting when you go to these sort of darker spaces. I remember the first time I, you know, essentially killed off a character. Um, the scene didn't make it into the story. Uh, it's in, it was any further west. I actually wrote a scene where the mother character overdosed, which it's alluded to in the beginning of the story. But I took out, I took out that scene. Um, I was upset for days. Like I cried afterward. I, I was like, I can't I'm a monster. I like, killed this woman. Like, what am I doing? You know, and. It, it made me just feel like this, the fiction was going off in a place that I no longer controlled so much. And that's when I knew my work was going in like a, a just a bigger direction than it had gone before, because I was just sort of allowing my characters to have their own individuality and mm -hmm. as individuals, we can be kind of, we can do kind of bad things to each other sometimes. Mm. Oh, I love that. Um... So this leads me to my next question, and then we can go into some of the audience Q&A. So everyone, if you have questions, please put it in the Q&A. Um, you know, something that you, Kali, wrote on social media that I've been thinking about kind of nonstop since you wrote it is that, um, you know, it, it's our duty as, as writers, editors, whatever, to share the knowledge um, that we have when it comes to craft and to make craft more accessible, you know, so it's not just that you have to get your MFA or that you have to, you know, work under certain people to learn, you know, the craft of writing. So I'm curious, what are some of the most, um, you know, either memorable teachings you guys have ever had or the thing that you keep coming back to over and over again when it comes to craft and writing? Mm -hmm. I can, I can go. <laughs> so I actually, I did a, I did an Instagram workshop recently and it cut off like right when I, I gave this like little bit of wisdom and people were like messaging me and they're like, can you, can you re like re-record? And I was like, never. No, I didn't say that. But <laughs> now I'm going to tell everybody what I got cut off before and I didn't get a say. Um, I took a travel writing nonfiction course or just some, some course for my English major requirements at Metro State with a professor named Dr. Doe. And Dr. Doe is very eccentric and she would like stand on chairs and she would just like shout and recite poetry. And I, she would play Sam Cooke while we did free rides. Mm. And I thought, I thought she was like the most like wild thing. I loved her. Um, I still love her, she's around. But she, she made us take note of how often we were using the five senses in our work. We actually had to go through and like draw little symbols like when we would use touch or taste or smell, um, sight. And that, that showed me that I was using smell a ton, which I still do, and mm -hmm. I actually have to pull back from. But it showed me I was lacking in things like touch and sound. And I really started to try to push to like elevate those. So I think if you, this is my bit of wisdom for today. Um, if you keep track of how often you're using sensory detail in your work, you can kind of manipulate it and then manipulate the reality of the work. But the first job is to figure out how you're using it and if you want to enhance it at all. Mm, that's a good one for sure. 
Um, I have two small ones. Um, the first is write for 15 minutes every day. <clears throat> I think that that was some of the best advice I was ever given because one thing that writers are really good at is not writing. Um, and like with everything else, like if you want to be a basketball player, you got to get on the court probably every day. If you want to be a ballerina, you have to train every day. If you want to play piano, you have to train every day. Writing is that. Um, and 15 minutes is a really good goal because even if you have six kids, as Marie Ponceau, the poet, did, she wrote for 15 minutes every day. Um, and you can write a whole novel that way. So, you know, even if it's just like when you're waiting at the dentist, file your pen and write for 15 minutes, everyone can do it. And, um, you know, and it's free too. You just need a bank pen and an envelope. Um, and then the other thing is uh, lower your expectations. That was the second um, best piece of advice I ever got. I think that a lot of people stop writing because what comes out the first, second, third time isn't as good as they want it to be. And that's just like the nature of writing. First drafts are just, you, you kind of, you just are getting everything out knowing that a lot of it is not gonna stay, that a lot of it isn't good. Um, and the difference between someone who writes and a writer is the revision process. Like you revise a ton. And that's, that's really when the writing starts for me. So write for 15 minutes every day and lower your expectations. That's the best craft advice I ever got. Oh, I like both of these a lot. Um, it does happen a lot in revision. I think sometimes the things I ask you guys to do in revision is a little crazy. And I am always surprised that you guys listen to me. <laughs> I mean, we could have an entire, we should do a part two where we just talk about what editing with Nicole was like. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought, I thought we were going to talk about that. <laughs> we should talk about it because it's true though, like, I thought I had a book done and then Nicole Counts read it and I was like, oh shit, this is like not a book yet at all. <laughs> and you know, I really like had to dig in, but it was the, that is also like the best part of it in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. That's when you're like really getting something. And that's why writing like is such a solitary thing. And then you get to work with someone like Nicole and you're like, wow, I'm someone else is like putting energy towards this thing yeah. that I have. What's better than that? I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, I definitely agree about the energy being put towards your work. Um, there have been times like you've read something for me, Nicole, and like days later you'll text me and you're like, I just had an epiphany about what you meant. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't know I meant what I meant. And you saw it and, and that's just so helpful. And just to have, you know, we talked about lowering our expectations. That was one of the things I was really prepared for is to have really low expectations of an editor. I mean, they prepared mm -hmm. me, they said that, they, I don't know, the, the world, the literature world, I was told like, <laughs> no one edits, nothing's going to happen once you turn it in. And that's not true. <laughs> that's not true with Nicole Counts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Nicole, like, what is it like when you get a piece of work and like, you can see that there are I mean, these like fantastical elements that need to be developed, like these intangible things in fiction mm. that need to be developed. Like, how are you so good at like targeting exactly what needs to happen? That's not just like this sentence needs to change or like this needs to be reorganized, but the more kind of like, um, you know, the intangibleness of fiction. You guys are being way too nice to me. Um, I... Maybe, you know, uh, Chris, our, our publisher at One World, he told me once that I, I feel like I say a lot to writers when I'm editing them, which is take it to the body. And I think I, I think I think the same way while I'm editing, where as I'm reading, I think about how my body is experiencing the work and whether I'm getting excited or whether I'm getting, you know, angry. And I, I, <laughs> I am learning more and more about myself that I, I have a lot of pent up anger that I think is my like generational, I don't think it's generational trauma for me. I think it's generational anger. And I mm -hmm. think when I start to get angry with the work, like that, it's not working in a certain way. That's always the part that I feel like that I need to have a conversation with the author about, you know? Um, but it's really like trusting your vision. You know, I feel like that's why I, I try to spend a lot of time just getting to know you and your work and what you guys want to do and what you want to accomplish versus like what I want the book to do. Cause it's always, I mean, the most like the, the reason I do what I do, I, I really have realized is because when the revision comes in and then I see what you guys have done, I'm like, like, 
holy shit. It's like not at all what I would have done and is so much better. It's so good, you know? It's like, it's so exciting. I mean, Kali just did this actually where one of the main characters in her work, she wrote years ago this backstory and she was like, oh, I'm just gonna send this to you so you like get to know his character better. And like, I have not stopped thinking about the scene of this woman in the bathtub in this kind of like home that's kind of this like white person making a museum of like native arts because that's what people do, you know? And I, I, I just think when I, when I get so excited like that and when I can't stop thinking about it, I know that that's the direction we need to go in, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, go in? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 no, no. <laughs> no we do. Oh, it's so good. I want to make sure that we get to some of these attendee questions. Um, so I guess I'll just, I'll go to the first one, which is when you write about trauma and it leaves you feeling heavy, what do you do to take care of yourself? Um, <laughs> such a good question. Honestly, I really both take a lot of baths. <laughs> baths. Yeah. I like talk too much about how like I know I will have made it when I have one of those like bowl baths you know what I mean uh, <laughs> that's yeah. all I want <laughs> I was in a lot of pain like literal physical pain um while writing parts of my book um it, it's funny that you say like take it to the body because I think that when I know work writing is working in some ways because I start having really physical reactions to it not to go back to like the epigenetics thing, but I think that there's something cellular that happens when you start like really targeting something that um, is in you. And that can be pleasure and like really just like being like, oh my God, this is so good. Or it can be extreme pain. Um, so I was started going to acupuncture every week. I did a lot of stuff to kind of just take care of my body. It's also just, you know, talking to Nicole, talking to your friends. Um, you know, it's solitary. So connecting with people helps me too. Yeah. Um, I, I also am a big bath fan. So that bowl you speak of, I'm like, oh, I have a fun for it. And I need to get the house first. And then <laughs> <laughs> um, I take a lot of walks. I'm a big walker. Um, and those, those help me just like think things through. Um, and they also help me transition between uh, between projects and things that I'm doing. So if I'm doing like promo stuff all day and then I need to have a space clear up so I can do that heavy work at night, the walk kind of cleanses that mental space for me. Um, I like, my family might not agree, but I do like seeing them. <laughs> so um, just being around them and laughing and, you know, hearing stories and seeing all the babies and things like that, that also serves as like a cleansing palette. It's like, oh, these, this is my people. This is where I come from. Okay, back to being alone at the desk. Um, mm -hmm. And then one of the biggest ways that I feel like I take care of myself is getting back to the land. Um, so either going up into the mountains that are nearby Denver or going down to Southern Colorado into like my ancestral homelands. Um, that kind of serves as like, it really feels like it recharges me on this like deep, deep level that I, I mean, I write about it all the time. So you probably know how I feel about the land, but it, um, just having that base is really important to me. And it does help me feel like I have purpose um, and that it's not all doom and gloom when I'm working on these things. Mm. The next one is, um, for both authors, have you ever had what seemed like a brilliant idea for characters that fizzled out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The answer is definitely yes with that one. <laughs> I, well, this is, um, you know, but that's okay though. So if you have a character that fizzled out, I would keep it and put it away somewhere because I recently found a story from 2010, like in my old emails, and I took that character and I repurposed her into a, a new short story. Um, so she still existed within me. I just hadn't found her right story yet, but now I, know, now I have it. But it took uh, 10 years. Mm -hmm. I feel like Gabby, your main character in your book, like you had ideas for her and then you had to try different, av like, different avenues of personalities before you hit the right one that felt right. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I I mean the revision process for Linda's personality was like 
multiple drafts. Um, and it's just like, and part of that is like learning how to write in some ways, not like literally, but like, you know, learning how to write a novel. Like you have to just like write things out in a very expansive way before you know if it works or not. Um, at least some characters. The, what I'm working on now, I'm like so much more organized and have such a better, like clear sense, but I'm also writing in the third person. So it's different when you're like in a first person perspective, like in someone's head, you kind of have to just like work things out. Um, I think, and then see what you need to trim back, what you need to change. And, yeah. Gabby, this one is uh, for you. Great writing tips. Is it is what it is stone the first novel manuscript you ever wrote, or do you have an unpublished manuscript before this? Uh, yes, I do. No one will ever see it. <laughs> please. <laughs> no, it's not something that I want to publish. You know, for me, like, I would say the third piece of advice I have for writing is that, like, you, it is just so important to, like, figure out, like, what is your unique voice? Um, and that, like, I don't totally understand, like, what that means, but for me, that is, like, figuring out what do you, like, care about? Like, what is it that interests you? Like, what, you know, what can you write for, like, an entire book? that you're just gonna be so addicted to that you wanna keep going back to it. And Brazil was that for me. But I have a book where I was like writing about this like slubby guy in like New York City. It was like the first person of this like guy that I hated. And every time I would go back to write it, I was like, I hate this character. Like, why am I doing this? But it was because I was writing a story that I had heard many times before. I thought that like writing from like the perspective of a man was gonna be like super subversive and interesting. It wasn't. So, you know, I wrote, I wrote a whole book about that. <laughs> I, like that, that I was like, is, nope. <laughs> that's like the other writing advice is like, you can, for me, I can immediately tell when someone is writing for themselves versus writing for like some sort of larger purpose or for their readers. And I think I think that's a big deal, you know. I think when you're writing and you're and you're controlling every single scene, every single character, you're not writing a, a book that should be shared widely. You're writing something where you're learning how to write, which has its yeah. own importance, of course, you know. But I think when the story starts coming through you, when you've like, as I always say, like clear yourself out a kind of enough mentally, like how Kali says she goes on walks or you go up to nature. I, I feel the exact same way. And then the story, you know. You, it's coming through you. It's not really that you're dictating it. Um, yeah, and also like, I didn't know that you could like absolutely love writing. I didn't know that. I had to, you know, write some, like, I was like, this has to be painful because those are the stories I've been told about writers. And then when I started writing stuff where I'm like- I'm drunk I, and like- <laughs> Yeah, like, you have to be wasted in order to get through a draft. <laughs> yeah. And now I'm just like, I am, you know, writing is my booze, man. I just love it. <laughs> writing is my booze. I love that. <laughs> Kali, this one is for you. Um, great to know you're writing a novel. What is it about? And do you have a plan for its structure before you begin writing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I, um, I started this novel before I started Sabrina and Karina, but I didn't have the skills. So we were talking about like, where, where do you learn how to write? Well, I did that in the short story form, which I know some short story practitioners would be mad at me for saying that I use that form as sort of a learning place, but I, I did, but then I fell in love with it. But um, Woman of Light is about my ancestors' migration from Southern Colorado to Denver in the 1920s. And it spans the 1890s, to the 1930s um, in Southern Colorado and in Denver. It's a love story. It's a story that looks at racial injustice in the city. And it also looks at um, what it means as a woman to carry on and work when you don't have men around to do that in that time period. Um, so yeah, I had a structure because I went through so many iterations of that, that book. So I wrote it from first person in the beginning, and then I pulled back and then I did third person and I had false starts that went on for 120 pages. And eventually my, my literary agent, she was like, you need to come up with a plan. Like you need to actually plot this book. So I have a very uh, strict structure that I followed, but now that I'm revising, I'm seeing you can, you can bend that structure. But yeah, I had, I had a structure and now I'm kind of veering off from it a little bit. 
I think also for for this novel more than I mean at least I saw in Sabrina and Karina because it's so historical and we're trying to hit certain marks like you'll outline out even a part just to see how it's going to work within history you know so it's not like a strict one it's just oh yeah this actually happened at this year so it, we we have to put it towards the beginning you know yeah, yeah, like I was looking up like certain things that happened in Roosevelt's presidency the other day. So I could like, oh, okay, well, that's what, what would be on the radio. So there is, time is actually um, one of the structures, which right. it always is, but it's it really first person? I was curious. What'd you say? Is it first person or third person? It's third. It's third. Yeah. And I don't think there are sections that are first. No, it's all third now, which is, I came to third person late. I did not start writing out in third person. That was, that was a later development. I just find it's easier to be structured with third person. First person is like really tough to structure, I think. Yeah, because of the consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, okay, there's a few more that I would just love to get to. Um, so <laughs> this is for Gabby, but you know, this could also be for Kali. What is your favorite thing about your sister who the book is dedicated to? This is a question from your sister, so I had to ask it. <laughs> oh my god, my favorite. We're all sisters, people, so I felt like I had to, you know, share some sister I love. It. <laughs> uh, my favorite thing about my sister is she is a um, has been a dedicated housing organizer in the South Bronx, and she is so fearless. Like she takes slumlords to court, um, and now she's going to be a lawyer. So they should really watch out. <laughs> we have so much fun together. She recaps like Real Housewives with me. And, um, you know. Oh, that's cute. You know, I can't ask Kali the same thing just because Kali has so many sisters. So um, I don't want you to get in trouble with who you're picking to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favorite sister, Kali? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> you're breaking up my family. <laughs> just kidding. Um, okay. So the last question is, how do you prefer to write? Laptop, pen, pencil? And I would just add on to that question. Do you, you know, is it different when you write short stories versus when you're writing like thoughts for the novel versus do either of you ever write poetry? I write by hand when I'm visualizing a scene. And this is something that I developed over time. Um, so before I write a scene, I take a notebook and I write down long, long hand, long hand, long form. I write down everything that I'm visualizing and I do sort of a mental walkthrough. And then I go to the computer and I type the prose uh, with the keyboard. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really have like a preference on um, the difference between short story and novel writing, anything like that. And it's actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately. When I write, I'm writing. And so um, the form always sort of just shifts around, but it feels like it's pulling from the same muscle for me. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm the same. I handwrite everything first. Um, poetry, nonfiction, novel. Um, I don't write like an entire novel by hand and then put it in the computer. But for me, like doing things by hand, again, like getting in the body, it's like you actually have like a physical connection. And I really do think that it's different than being for, for drafting, being at a computer that creates some distance. But it's also like an, for an editing process for me, like I write by hand and it sort of makes it less precious. Like there's something about it being on the computer where you're like, this needs to be like final when it's coming out. And writing by hand, you can kind of like sketch and draw lines and like whatever. And then when it goes into the computer, it's the first round of a kind of like a light edit for me. Mm, mm. I think that's important. I think when I'm talking to writers sometimes, especially when you get caught up in a scene, and this doesn't matter if it's fiction, nonfiction, or, or poetry. I'm working with someone right now who's writing like humorous essays. And I, I, I tell people a lot like at some point, I think you have to actually step away from the computer when you're kind of struggling with certain things. and and just go back to like the purpose of why you're writing this. And I think that is easier longhand, you know, or whatever, if you're blocked, I think that's a good, a good struggle um, or a good way to, you know, figure out that struggle is to do it by hand. Um, okay, I, that is all the time we have, but thank you both so, so much for joining me. This has been awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you everybody who watched us. <laughs> uh -huh.